My name is Jeremy Little and I'll be your host today um, for another Telstra Live event. And today we are talking about staying secure in a mobile future. And we're joined by two extremely uh, experienced and, and fantastic guests today, Danny and Rajiv, that I will introduce in a minute. Now, uh, as it's a, a live event, it's interactive. We do want to hear from you on the call um, and who are tuning in live to this. So please do send your questions through and we're also going to be running some audience polls throughout um, this virtual event. So make sure you stay online all the way to the end. There's going to be some uh, special nuggets uh, and takeaways from our guests. Now, as I mentioned, staying secure in a mobile future is the topic for today. Now, for those that are new to the event or even if you're coming back, remember you can, you can move and, and play with your own user experience so you can move the windows around, we have bios for our speakers, we have some slides that you can read through and download. Um, so get into the platform and be, and please do be interactive. Now, we are joined today by Rajiv Gupta, the Vice President of Strategy and Pre-Sales Zim, from Zimperium, and Danny Rostevsky, the General Manager of Security Practice at Telstra. Guys, thank you for joining us, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, hi so, Jeremy and hi everyone, great to be on the call. Thanks guys. Now I'm going to give you guys uh, an opportunity to introduce yourselves whilst we go to the first polling question from the audience. So, for those of you that are watching in, the, the question that we would like you to answer is, does your business rely on mobile technologies for employees and customers? There's a few answers there. Select the one that is most appropriate to, to you. We're going to leave that up. Um, and whilst you guys are answering that, Rajiv, would you please give us a, a bit of an introduction to yourself? Uh, sure, Jeremy. Thanks uh, for having me today. And uh, actually, as you guys uh, probably know, I'm the head of strategy and pre-sales uh, for Zimperium. Uh, Zimperium actually is the leader in mobile threat defense uh, and uh, uses uh, actually its uh, patented behavior anomaly detection engine uh, to detect all sorts of cyber threats uh, on, on the device. And we will go into the details as we go through the presentation. Uh, I am actually based out of San Francisco, which is uh, Zimperium headquarters. And as part of my current role, actually, I work uh, very closely with large enterprises uh, to help them understand security issues as it relates to mobile. And, uh, you know, hopefully the session today is going to be of uh, some interest to you guys, and, uh, you know, hopefully you're going to learn something as we go through that and uh, explore uh, new mobile threats uh, that are prevalent these days. Over to you, Denny. Great. Uh, thanks, Rajiv, and, and hi, everyone. Um, a little bit about myself. My role within Telstra involves heading up the Center of Excellence in Telstra Security Practice, uh, effectively, my team helps build the capability and services that we take to market within the security services portfolio. So, um, so we work quite closely with our technology partners like Semperion that we have here today. And um, if I take a bit of time to actually give a bit more context on today's topic. So we're going to talk about mobile security and in particular the challenges that IT departments face in dealing with problems that arise from these technologies and what organizations can essentially do about it um, and particularly how to deal with more advanced threats uh, in the second half of this presentation which uh, Rajiv will take us through. Uh, we all know that uh, mobility services are transforming the way employees and our customers carry out their personal and business lives. However, security is a big part of mobility and, and not surprising, uh, it's a concern for organizations today because as we move towards an always on uh, connected mobile culture, and, and let's face it, I mean, we're all uh, always at arm's reach of a mobile device, or at least I am, um, the data and applications that we have access to is greater than ever before. So hopefully you'll get some really good insights and learnings out of the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you, Danny and Rajiv. Um, so let's look at the answers to the poll. And it's telling us that 35%, 33%, it's pretty split actually, but yes, <laughs> most businesses on the call rely on mobile technologies and it's at varying degrees of, uh, of, of importance and significance. But there you go, very important. So I think, Danny, that's a, a, a nice segue into what you'll be talking about, starting with mobile and wireless technology shaping how we do business. 
Yeah, great. Um, so um, essentially there are uh, three mega trends that are reinventing the IT landscape today and, and quite frankly changing our everyday lives, right, both in the workplace and at home. Uh, and these are essentially um, mobility, cloud and big data. But if you focus on mobility, it's, it's this technology that's really fueling the demand for the other mega trends. Mobility alone has been um, already uh, already taken off and um, ubiquitously actually um, uh, applied across kind of um, the, the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to see our daily lives without it and it's going to grow at a tremendous rate, right? Uh, we've got some 50 uh, billion smart devices predicted to connect to the internet in the next five years and, and most of them will actually be wireless technologies of some sort. But from a business uh, point of view today, as much as 40% uh, of the global workforce is mobile in some fashion or another, and it's set to rise to you know 80% of users carrying out their work uh, remotely via web and, and mobile technology uh, in the next five years or so. But if we couple uh, that with almost um, you know 90% of business applications um, uh, being delivered by cloud infrastructure you effectively have, um, for lack of a better word, a mobile-delivered cloud uh, world. Um, and, and I mean, uh, as you kind of look at all of these technologies uh, combining together, the figures are, are staggering, right? Consider that, considering that mobile devices, um, and, and that's mobile devices essentially with data uh, internet connectivity have only really been around in the last 10 to 15 years. So depending on whether you consider low speed data connectivity useful or not. So we're going to see mobility's influence um, in shaping other mega trends uh, um, really uh, having a large significant uh, factor going forward uh, as it is today. So um, given that uh, mobility is, is shaping out to be a, a mega trend, it does uh, influence uh, employees within organisations quite uh, substantially also. Uh, if we have a look at the challenges uh, for IT departments, and there are many, um, a lot of uh, corporates today are still hesitant about allowing end users to use non-approved uh, smartphones or tablets. Um, however, a growing number of corporate users are using whatever device, application or, or technology they want, regardless of IT policies, right? Uh, IT departments have effectively um, lost, uh, I know that's a harsh word, but they certainly have uh, lessened the ability to completely mandate uh, the choice of smartphone or tablet uh, that corp corporate users can bring into the workplace. I think it's a clear trend whether we like it or not. So not only have employees um, started bringing their own devices and technologies to the workplace, uh, but they've started actually putting pressure on IT departments on the way they want to work. And, and this slide kind of talks about uh, a few examples on the kinds of behaviours IT departments have to deal with. So if you take a few of those as an example, employees typically own multiple devices these days. So IT departments have to cater and um, support not only one or two devices, but typically on average three devices and up to six devices in future if you base it on industry trends uh, that they actually need to actually support uh, going forward and uh, forward, and that includes dealing with multiple devices, operating systems, and, and let's not forget the myriad of applications that might sit across all of these devices. Um, and, and here's a funny one. It's probably not not surprising, but employees believe that uh, the IT department is ultimately responsible for security and, and not them. I mean, this is a uh, an un, 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 uh, um, unfortunate uh, common mis, misconception, uh, misconception among uh, employees, and the IT department is solely, you know, the, the IT department is 
solely responsible for the security of corporate information. I mean, this is a huge concern because essentially IT departments don't have full control of employee actions or um, or when they use actually corporate data via some of these uh, devices. In fact, the responsibility needs to be shared between not only IT departments but employees. Another interesting kind of behaviour that uh, employees are bringing to the table is um, they will violate IT policies if they see um, necessary to actually do their job. Uh, and this is a kind of an interesting one, but it uh, is a, a fairly large threat uh, from users who are increasingly using their mobile uh, devices with disregard uh, for IT policies. Um, and, and, the, and the reasons why they do, I mean, could, could vary from you know, just recreational activities like playing games or checking their personal email or on social um, networking sites while being connected to the corporate network. Now, some of these applications themselves um, can pose actually a significant risk for the organ organisation. Um, there's already been a few media reports about malicious apps being embedded in uh, Facebook um, itself and users being exposed to it. I mean, the other kind of key aspect of this is um, employers try uh, and prefer a unconventional work schedule. So, um, you know, there's no no surprise that organisations within the, uh, in Australia are actually moving towards a remote working um, culture with employees actually working more and more from home. But the worry for IT departments um, uh, is smartphones and tablets can, can essentially access sensitive or proprietary information, company data in other words, uh, from almost anywhere, right? Um, and um, it's relatively easy to have some of that data exposed to an unsecure network like, like the internet. And whether it's intentionally or um, unintentionally, it really is um, you know, kind of um, irrespective to the IT department. They have to deal with security incidents um, if, they, if they do arise for whatever reason. And Danny, I might jump in there because it's interesting. It, it leads into um, some information that we were talking about at a previous live virtual event about the super user, this study that Telstra did on, on um, the fact that people will get access to um, mobility services and applications whether the, the organisation um, supplies them or not. Um, and, and so it's an, it, it, it creates an interesting dilemma for the IT and the person in, uh, in involved in engaging security. And I think it's a good opportunity to throw in an example. So, so talk to us about Telstra, if you don't mind me throwing a, the, the question in, and about how Telstra has approached the deployment of mobility services for its employees internally. Yeah, um, I mean, first Telstra does deploy quite um, an extensive set of uh, mobile security technologies and solutions across its uh, fleet of um, mobile devices for its employees. I mean, and the technologies, the security technologies can ran, run um, range from you know MDM tool sets, uh, mobile, uh, mobile uh, device management tool tool sets to data encryption on, on the device itself. But however, probably the more important thing to note is whatever technologies and organizations deploy, the starting point of any mobility adoption within an organization is to define a corporate mobile user policy that clearly outlines how mobile devices can be used within the organization, um, and more importantly, how sensitive uh, data or company data should be handled by employees and I think that's we kind of get too caught up in uh, finding a technical solution I and mean, sometimes we uh, we uh, forget the people and the process aspect so that's kind of the first uh, consideration to actually take take note of it and, and Telstra does in addition to kind of the security controls that, to, uh, that we deploy across our, our mobile devices, employee mobile devices and, and other mobile um, uh, technologies, 
uh, we do provide a heavy focus on the policy that's accepted in the organisation and create an awareness and training program, right? So uh, taking uh, into account the people aspect of, of that technology. So I think it's a, a really important thing to bring out as part of this discussion. Great, thanks. Um, so, and, and that's actually a good lead into to this slide because there is a lot of balancing um, acts that an IT department or, or a corporation itself needs to do. And there are three critical factors that need to be considered as organisations move into a mobile future. I mean, the first um, key observation that we've had with a lot of our customers is uh, to really embrace flexibility um, and, and um, you know like you said Jeremy I don't think there's a way out of it I mean employees are going to bring um, new technologies whether it's mobile or, or apps uh, associated with these, uh, with these with these devices regardless of whether the IT department um, wanted or not so lo it, the lockdown mode of operating in that environment is effectively um, you know non-productive and, and uh, to be honest, I don't think is, is going to work much longer going forward. So IT uh, departments do have to provide flexibility and choice to employees uh, who not only choose to bring their own mobile devices, but like I said, extend it to applications uh, to be more productive and, and which can only really benefit the, the business at the end of the day. The, the second key, um, I suppose, observations that we're seeing um, is uh, a mobile first user experience um, and, and what we mean by that is getting the mobile user experience right for employees and customers first. Uh, one of our customers um, that we've recently engaged actually was working on a number of different apps developing uh, that they were developing for their clientele but they actually started working on the mobile version of that app first uh, before they actually looked towards deploying it in a more traditional web-based app as opposed to the other way around um, as it's you know, done in the past. So um, more often than not, the customer experience uh, that organisations are developing is one and the same that they're developing for internal employees. So this really provides a real emphasis on consistent and great user experience, no matter who the audience is. And the last kind of um, uh, ball in the juggling act for, for IT departments, if I can phrase it like that, is obviously the the uh, uh, the security side of things. So IT departments are concerned about this uh, uh, about this aspect of of these uh, kind of wireless and mobility technologies, particularly how to manage risk of new, um, new rich mobile applications because there is more risk to the company data and brand and, and intellectual property or even uh, um, an impact to, to their revenue. So if you uh, kind of combine all of these factors, um, it really does prevent a serious dilemma for, for, for IT. On one hand, you've got smartphones and tablets uh, that are simply too powerful and useful to, to ignore. Uh, they certainly empower users in completely new ways and enable them to be more flexible and productive. However, security must be seen as an enabler for the business rather than holding it back from the rewards uh, of many of these new new uh, technologies uh, that, that they have to offer. Um, the key thing here, I suppose, is the, the key takeaway. Security needs to be seen as an enabler, facilitator by the ID department that actually brings these technologies on the journey that the business can actually benefit from. So um, if, we, if we kind of move on and, and have a look at uh, the threat landscape, I mean, yes, it is becoming complex and attacks are becoming more sophisticated, but it's the sheer volume of these attacks that, that's kind of phenomenal. Uh, something like 3,100 um, new, new malware instances are released into the wild every day. Um, and increasingly, um, a large amount of these are actually targeted at mobile operating systems and applications that reside on these. Um, mobile devices are rapidly becoming, um, you know, a potential treasure trove of of data for cyber 
criminals and uh, also presents an easy way to actually get to the end user through uh, the likes of social engineering techniques uh, such as um, uh, phishing email for instance. And the reason why it's so attractive these days to target mobile devices is that hackers can get a twofold benefit, uh, so to speak, when trying to steal data on mobile devices. So uh, devices too, they often often contain both uh, personal and business data. So hackers can can use personal data for other malicious activities and and uh, uh, steal people's identities to kind of carry out those activities, while also using corporate data to actually potentially sell and then make a profit or at least uh, uh, share more widely uh, sensitive information that that would otherwise uh, uh, wouldn't uh, be uh, um, of of uh, consideration for for obviously uh, that company. Um, and it really doesn't matter if um, you know some of these threats are, are done maliciously or not, or whether they're actually being uh, driven by paid or free apps, or what the operating system is. I think mean, um, no no device or operating system is actually immune to some of these threats. And there was actually a recent incident that actually involved uh, the Apple App Store where. Uh, cyber criminals actually embedded malicious code into an application software development kit and then was subsequently used by unsuspecting software developers to build legitimate application, but unknown to them, they were effectively given access to cyber criminals who had uh, a hand in developing that malicious toolkit in the first place. So um, attacks are, are always going to be kind of the... Uh, um, uh, the attack service is always going to be um, uh, extensive when we get uh, a large distribution of these weak endpoints being uh, prevalent in, in, in the industry. Um, so, so Danny, if, if I may, can I, can I jump in with another question? Because I think that, that, that is really interesting. It sparked a thought in my mind, which I'd open up to either of you to answer. But You've, got, you've touched on personal information versus corporate information, so obviously the, the organisation is going to be worried about its own security, but is, is, does the duty of care of an IT manager or a security manager extend only to the corporate information, or do you think that there, it extends to some of the people's personal information as well? Like, what, Where do you draw the line? Um, it's a very good question, and I don't think there's um, a kind of a clear answer to it. I think it comes down to individual corporations and that's why I kind of alluded to a starting point for any of these technologies to actually define a an acceptable user mobile policy and that that in itself, um, depending on the organisation itself, should actually uh, define whether they want to take on responsibility of personal data that might be on a uh, mobile device um, that uh, the organisation has provided to an employee or vice versa in terms of um, how an employee that brings their own device uh, to the workplace actually treats company data. So unfortunately um, th there's no clear answer. It, it, it is an interesting topic and it's a, it's a it is actually a dilemma for IT departments because um, um, it, it is, um, in some cases, a um, you know some of these apps. The more we kind of uh, look at those uh, in in this context, um, they're actually used for for both aspects. Uh, I know, for argument's sake, you know we do a lot of remote working and we use um, some of the social media for work and for personal use. So um, it's actually really hard. Um, how do you separate, um, um, you know, instances of using the same app when when it actually applies to both personal and business use? Um, unfortunately, no one solved that <laughs> that that uh, problem yeah. yet. Rajiv, what it, do you it think? also is one of the reasons, right, why we get a lot of pushback from the users, right, where they don't want to adopt MDM or EMM type solutions because it kind of bleeds into. Hey, you know, my company is watching over me when I'm watch, you know, I'm at my home on a Saturday evening at 8 p.m. I'm doing my own work. I'm playing game or whatever I'm doing on my personal phone. But, you know, there is in my back of my mind that everything I'm doing on my phone is being watched by my company, right? So that's actually brings up a very, very good point, right? What, where do we actually draw the line? 
you know, and as we go through actually later part of the presentation, I'll touch a little bit again on this very topic that why user privacy actually is becoming of paramount importance, right? And I think, Danny, you mentioned earlier on a people and process aspect, right? So we just cannot take the technology and then force it through uh, the employees and the users. We have to ultimately look into the whole people aspect, which ultimately bleeds into the whole user privacy. Yeah. And, and you're going to have company-issued hardware versus personal hardware and company-issued software versus the software that people are already using. So it seems, seems like a pretty complicated issue. Is, is there any example of best, of, of best practice where you've seen that a company's done this and the staff have been really happy about it? What, what I have seen personally is that a lot of company-owned devices is the, where the company takes the liberty to actually do whatever they want to do with the devices, but then as the PYOD is increasing and more and more people are bringing their own devices is where the company is saying, okay, maybe we can go with MAM type solution instead of MDM, uh, but then, uh, you know, they compromise on the total security aspect of the, the platform and, uh, you know, where now things starting falling apart. So it's, it's uh, becomes, I think the BYOD is still not under fully control, right? A lot of companies are struggling and trying to figure out what's the best policy there. Uh, Danny, what do you think? Do you, are you seeing the same yeah, thing? I yeah, exactly. I mean, I tend to agree. I mean, th there is a good example where I've seen companies, and, and it's always going to be a compromise, but some companies um, um, do uh, kind of, um, you know, allow themselves to or allow employees to kind of use it for personal uh, personal use, but they do uh, provide guidance on, so if for argument's sake, um, if, if they are using a file sharing app, uh, the corporate might actually provide them guidance on a preferred file sharing app where they kind of see it more secure or fits their corporate policies better. So there is instances where an organisation might not totally prevent an employee using it for personal use but might uh, provide guidance on um, uh, an application that probably suits their security posture better or, or as seen as being more secure. And, and we had one of our one of our viewers, you know, make the point that if user data is stored on a corporate database, it should be the corporate's responsibility by default to protect that, which you know clearly it would be. Um, but but then if you've got individuals with access to that data, then it, it, it comes down to policies and procedures to help the individuals understand how what the what the corporate stance on, is on exactly. that. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, that, and that's why, uh, again, having that uh, very clear, defined user policy for mobile data uh, usage, not only of the device itself, but uh, like you mentioned, accessing corporate data over a number of different scenarios is important for employees to, to kind of grasp and understand. Because technologies can do so much um, and they won't prevent uh, all instances of, of data being uh, misused. So there's, a, there's an important people aspect for them to understand what they can and shouldn't do, uh, what they can and can't do uh, when it kind of um, gets into uh, accessing corporate data or at least sensitive information. Beautiful. Look, look it's just uh, sensitive of time, Danny. Why don't we, we jump back into to the content that you've got before we jump into the next poll question? Sure, sure. Uh, look, and, and uh, this slide is really um, probably no, no big surprise to our, our audience members, and it's really just saying that uh, the traditional enterprise boundaries no longer defined, um, you know, in in strict terms. Um, as we kind of adopt these mobile technolo technologies, and and data is actually accessed from cloud applications over almost anywhere. Um, uh, you know the, the the boundaries are becoming such that um, corporations need to uh, extend those to encompass uh, users endpoints and on the other side um, uh, applications so uh, it, it is a big challenge and and here's another reason why to be kind of paranoid about the traditional perimeter being dissolved where it no longer fits the the uh, the security model because hackers can, and they're becoming wise enough uh, to the fact that sometimes it's easier to compromise a vulnerable endpoint like a mobile device that hasn't been patched for argument's sake 
and it's essentially have uh, the em employee bypass the organisation's traditional security uh, perimeter, like, like your firewalls, by simply walking into the office <laughs> with an affected device. And once that device is in a secure, what, what seemingly looks like a secure uh, corporate environment, um, you know, the, the infected device can actually wreak ha havoc. So um, it's actually more than just extending the perimeter to these end, end devices, it's actually uh, IT departments need to look at uh, the way they actually deploy um, and protect their, uh, their their organization because it's fundamentally different and mobile technology is actually driving that, that change in outlook. Um, if we look at um, kind of the top uh, security threats, and I won't spend too, mu too much time on this, but um, look, I mean, viruses and, and malware are probably the most common threat on mobile devices and, and certainly on traditional laptops and, and PCs. Um, you know, malware can be anything from worms to, you know, Trojan horses, uh, spyware to keyloggers, rootkits, and, and you name it. I mean, one important to, uh, thing to note about um, malware is um, the recent surge uh, this year with ransomware on PCs, and, and certainly mobile devices are heading in the same direction. Now, ransomware is where a cyber criminal infects your PC or, or your mobile device with mal malware and uh, encrypts your data so you, you can't essentially retrieve it anymore. And then uh, progressively ask for a sum of money to be paid if you want uh, the data to be unlocked uh, so you can reuse again. So, uh, you know, the, the trends that we're actually seeing in the PC or the traditional um, uh, PC world are actually extending those same threats in, 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 on, on mobile devices. Now, social engineering attacks are also fairly common because they're, they're kind of low technical attacks, uh, if I can put it that way. Um, and just like uh, PC scams, you know, the bad guys are using social engineering for uh, mobile apps or, or even, I mean, I'm sure some of you would have received, you know, an SMS tech text message asking you to go to a particular URL um, and then they take advantage of human behaviour and, and trust and then they try and trick um, a victim to disclose personal information in some way by pretending to originate from a legitimate source or, or application. Um, and I think the last threat I kind of will, will touch on is um, data loss uh, because it's kind of a unique one. It doesn't always need to be driven by malware. So data loss is where um, data on, on a mobile phone can be leaked or, or stolen from from uh, the likes of malware, etc. But um, it, there's also a another factor to data loss, and that is unintentional data loss, with that may be uh, as a result of an employee perhaps sharing sensitive company information via people outside of their organisation and uh, unintentionally um, um, and uh, that could obviously have some 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 impact to the organisation. So it's important to kind of look at not only the threats that are affecting um, uh, you know, mobile technologies themselves but the user aspect of them perhaps misusing misusing um, those mobile technologies in ways that that may not be appropriate for the organisation, and that could be intentional, but it also, um, you know, in, in cases where where it might not be um, as clear to the user that they're breaking breaking some rules that the organisation might not allow them to do so. Danny, um, I might just jump in and, and throw to Rajiv yeah. really quickly. Rajiv, what, like I know you're going to go into some real world examples, but just on those points that Danny brought up, is there any anything that you've seen as like a top uh, risk in in the real world that people on the call should be thinking about? Yeah, so basically, you know, um, there are two main things that happens on the mobile, right? The user either is after the data that sits on the mobile, that uh, data loss part. But, uh, you know, mobile doesn't really contain a lot. But what it does contain is uh, user ID information, a lot of uh, the username passwords that are either cached into the browser or saved into notes or other places, right? So that's a very, very critical information. And uh, if you 
connect that piece of information with the single sign-on type of capabilities. And if the bad guy gets in through one of the mobile device, then he has that penetration into the enterprise uh, through that whole single sign-on. And the other um, reason why the mobile devices are getting hacked is because they, the bad guys eventually make that mobile device as a conduit uh, into the enterprise. So that mobile device, because it goes in and out of the enterprise seamlessly, as Danny talked earlier on, uh, the whole uh, you know boundaryless organization, uh, that uh, allows the bad guy to keep scanning and doing keep doing that exfiltration from the enterprise as this device enter and leaves the enterprise. So I think it kind of touches on more than one, the whole ransomware, the, mo the malware, and how it leads to data loss and ultimately makes this device as a, as a conduit back into the enterprise. So they kind of come, come all in, hand in hand. Beautiful. Thank you. All right, Danny, let's, let's run through the next two and up into the poll question. Yeah, cool. Um, so very briefly, I mean, th there is uh, four key categories um, that uh, security solutions, particularly as it applies to kind of mobile devices, that organisations need to consider. And the first one being there is device management or device protection, if you like. And that's where, where um, the software essentially allows you to lock down and wipe information on the mobile device. I mean, we're talking about uh, mobile device management um, uh, platforms or solutions there, but also includes um, other traditional uh, security controls like anti-malware, uh, mobile device firewall and IPS, um, which our partners, you know, um, Rajiv will, will talk about um, in in uh, shortly after after I uh, finish off um, a, a few more slides. The the second kind of key category there is application management. So. Um, application monitoring control software that provides enterprises with greater visibility on how employees are using mobile applications. And it also allows for the implementation of controls in line with security policies. So for instance, if we had a customer requirement application to be only used when it's connected to the corporate wireless network and not do anything else, you could effectively um, deploy that, that policy content or data management or, or protection, and this is where uh, you've got uh, solutions that uh, prevent data loss and, and it allows the enforcement of data security policies on the management, on the mobile, sorry, device, including da data encryption. Um, access management uh, or protection, and this is where, um, you know, kind of uh, in some cases actually not, not taken into account um, quite readily because it's left up to the applications who actually provide the security is when when applications do talk with other um, uh, machines or computers or other applications, other bit of software outside of the mobile app, um, ensuring that, that that data being transmitted is actually encrypted and or has a secure connection. Um, and that can be done uh, quite a number of different ways. So it's important to kind of take that into consideration. And, and lastly, if we have a look at a holistic approach to mobile enterprise security, uh, there are a number of different kind of components to it. So we talked about the key capability uh, pillars uh, that fit into each of these uh, uh, you know, categories that include the device, application, content or data, and the access security. But there are two other critical uh, key elements, and that is corporate security governance, as we talked about, the people and the process side of things, and the other being security intelligence and analytics. So under security governance, first, um, organizations should uh, ensure that uh, they have a modern policy uh, defined, um, and that that's corporate-wide, um, that, that kind of underpins the support of the business operations. So the policy should describe how employees can use a device to access corporate networks or data, but more importantly, to what extent and how personal use of the device is acceptable during uh, working hours. And, and many people, we talked about this, find it as a basic <laughs> conflict of, of rights due to the fact that uh, the device may have been uh, purchased to them and there's no easy answer to kind of uh, sort that out other than clearly defining what it is um, the organisation's um, willing to kind of um, accept as part of that use. Uh, so, um, but whatever the kind of case is, there's um, 
there's uh, the kind of um, um, you know critical factor of protecting the business um, um, uh, first. So when it comes to especially sensitive uh, data, the second component under under governance is to um, is make sure your employees are aware of it. So there's no point in having a a kind of um, um, you know policy in place if they're not aware of it or they're not even trained on it. And make sure that you have uh, the right regular compliance and assessment that actually go along uh, with that to make sure that that's actually readily um, uh, enforced and knowledgeable by your employees. And, and quickly, lastly, um, security intelligence. So while all the security controls might do their job really well, uh, sometimes it's the combination of these events across different areas that highlight suspicious activity that leads to identifying a threat. So for instance, someone trying to log on to the same application across multiple devices outside of your organisation. So the app might do its uh, job in denying access to it uh, without the right credentials, but you know, security intelligence and, and gathering some of the event security event information across these devices actually will highlight the someone um, you know targeting a particular application and uh, trying to uh, exploit it for for potential some some vulnerabilities or weaknesses. So correlating security events uh, provides greater visibility of what's happening across your organisation on, on multiple levels and becomes. Um, extremely important, especially where you've got a wide distributed uh, mobile workforce. Thank you very much, Danny. So let's jump into the next polling question with the audience, uh, and then I'm going to jump to a question that hopefully, Rajiv, you can help me with. But first of all, for the audience, um, does your business have uh, BYOD corporate policies in place? Um, so please jump in and answer that. Whilst you're answering that, Rajiv, hopefully you can help me with this. If not, Danny, feel free to jump in. But um, what's the most frequent oversight customers tend to overlook when deploying mobility solutions? Well, um, I think um, that's, a, that's a great question because what happens is mobility comes with the, the kind of the notion that it's built with security from ground up, right, the whole application sandbox architecture. And then on top of that, uh, you know, when uh, enterprises apply some sort of a combination of uh, MDM, EMM, or MCM solution, they tend to believe that the job is done. And uh, they, they overlook the whole external threats that we so call it, um, which is basically so easy to actually get into an, uh, a mobile device which, uh, as Danny talked about, so easily goes in and out of the enterprise. Even though you have uh, the security layer of the EMM on top of it, uh, unfortunately, it's still running over a shaky or a, a buggy operating system. So if uh, your foundation is not strong, you know, and if the bad guys get into that, uh, right, it, everything on top of that ultimately is uh, shaky. So I think, um, as uh, somebody said, that security always comes in layers. Uh, it's not wise to just have one layer of security when it comes to mobile. You have to look at all different ways the bad guys can get in. And uh, frankly speaking, it all it takes is one in a million hit for the bad guy. That kind of a success rate is what they need to ultimately destroy an organization. Thank you very much. So let's, let's jump into the answers. So does your business have bring your own device corporate policies in place? The vast majority do not or need to deploy them. So very interesting. Um, and, and on that, I'm going to hand over to you, Rajiv. We've, we've got about 12, 13 minutes left before we're going to be wrapping up. So please tell us a little bit about uh, Zimperium and, and what you guys are doing in this, spi this uh, space. Absolutely. Let me jump in. Uh, so, you know, a lot of things that Danny, you talked about actually, you know, kind of leads uh, into my discussion where, uh, you know, as uh, you would see that how we don't let any PC enter our workforce without any type of an endpoint security today. And uh, if you look at the penetration or the growth of PC market compared to the, the mobile devices, it's uh, completely different, right? You're talking about 4 billion people buying phones compared to 1.6 billion uh, PCs every five years, right? So, And then um, all these phones, uh, they are entering into the into our enterprises without any kind of a security on it. And uh, frankly, you know, speaking, the phone, the smartphone today is probably more powerful and more, it can do more than what a PC uh, was able to do, let's say, five years back. So, you know, these things are definitely very high-end computing devices that enter into our enterprises without any kind of checks and balances in place. 
So uh, with that, uh, let me actually jump in to talk about the mobile architecture. I kind of highlighted a little bit uh, earlier, but the, the whole notion that mobile is secure uh, is coming from this uh, whole architecture where the kernel at the core is uh, having the unlimited access to the to the mobile device, whereas if you go out towards the outer rings, you know, especially the ring three is where the applications are running. And since most of the things on the mobile device run in uh, ring three, uh, you know, they're generally secure because they don't have access to ring two, ring one, or ring zero. And uh, similarly so, when we talk about the EMM features, they're all running at higher layers within the architecture. Uh, however, uh, you know, the bad guys don't play by the rule. Uh, those um, uh, things that are highlighted on the right side, they're all the different attack types and attack vectors that let the bad guys get into uh, either uh, from ring 3 to ring 2 to ring 1 to ultimately into the kernel. And once they get at the kernel mode, or uh, they actually have the ability to run and kind of an exploit at the kernel level, then they have unlimited access to the entire device. And then application security or the container or anything else that's running on the device, it's all um, kind of at that point in time of no use. So let me talk specifically about uh, two main things. One is the network-based attacks where the attack is coming from a network where you're connected to a public Wi-Fi or something, and uh, the other is uh, the stage fright. So stage fright is very recent uh, activity. It means we discovered our research labs actually discovered stage fright uh, recently, and uh, you know we kind of disclosed it back to Google. They patched it, and you know there's a long story that I'm sure if you guys are connected to the security, you would have read a lot about it. The most interesting thing about the stage fright was that it's a collection of seven critical vulnerabilities, and you know the, the worst part is that um, there is absolutely no user action required whatsoever. So you could have your phone sitting on the desk; it would receive an MMS message, and uh, just by receiving that MMS message, the bad guy can now remotely control the device. He can turn on the camera, turn on the audio. He can even root the device remotely, uh, take anything he wants, and then even before leaving that guy can actually delete the MMS message so that you have no trace left whatsoever that you were actually ever hacked, right? So this is the worst of all vulnerabilities known till date, and it does impact every Android device out there, you know, uh, close to a billion devices. Uh, the only devices that it doesn't impact are uh, Android 2.2 or 2.3 and before. Uh, even the 5.0 and the 5.1, the whole lollipop and uh, the latest releases, they are all impacted by stage fright. So this is just a kind of a classic example of uh, the type of attacks the bad guys are coming up with these days and how they can actually exploit um, the, the mobile devices today. So going into and kind of a recapping the entire mobile threat landscape, the attacks can come from the network side or the host side. Uh, one of the threat vectors here is uh, you see on the top is apps or the malware. Uh, I would say a lot of companies talk about the malware and the malicious apps, so, uh, so to say, but that's one of many threat vectors. Your device can get compromised. If you're standing on an airport, you connect to a USB charger. That USB charger could actually be a malicious charger that can inject uh, malicious code into the device or can extract or steal pictures from your phone. You know, things like that are pretty common. These are called juice jacking. There's actually a technical term for it. Um, in the same day, right, you could actually be connected to a, a cell tower. You will see 3G, 4G on your phone, but you could still be getting hacked by that cell tower. That cell tower is not a, a real cell tower. It's a fictitious or a malicious cell tower. And they're actually on the rise. We saw uh, some sites of it. Actually, there was a couple of incidents in Sydney itself uh, that were reported. And then we, even in the U.S., there are a few incidents that happened in Texas, uh, you know, last month that have been reported. And uh, the, uh, these are all the different attack vectors. Once the device is compromised by any of these attack vectors, at that point in time, you know, the bad things can happen where if, if at all uh, that exploit goes through what we call privilege escalation, then it can ultimately get into any application sandbox. It can get into any container, whether whatever the MAM container you may have, uh, that security uh, doesn't, doesn't really stand anymore. Right, because you can get in and out of any container, any sandbox. So with that, let me um, jump in, uh, talk about uh, how we complement the entire EMMs. Uh, when, while we complete the picture in terms of uh, threat landscape and uh, provide protection against all these external threats uh, that can come to the mobile device, we also integrate into all those solutions. So it kind of uh, completes the picture from that perspective. Right, It's very, very complementary to the leading MDM solutions out there and uh, it makes the, the entire policy enforcement uh, uh, when the device is under threat uh, kind of a seamless function for the IT to implement, All right? Um, so getting into the next poll question here, uh, Jeremy. 
So look, we're going to again go out to our audience. What major impact would your business face from a mobile threat? And whilst you guys are answering that, Rajiv, when you were talking about some of those examples, a question came up from um, in my mind. Like, given these uh, bogus towers or some of these other threats that are, that seem to be out of control, like if I'm a secure, the individual in an organisation in in control of our security, how what should I be doing to to try and protect my company against a threat like that? Well, yeah. So that's that's the it's a great question because you got to look at the security from a holistic viewpoint, right? You know, you can't be looking at just one threat vector, let's say apps or network or, you know, so the attacks can come from even the the Bluetooth and NFC or, uh, you know, all the different ways the mobile devices are used out there. So you've got to find a solution that's built from ground up for mobility and it can actually protect against all different type of attack vectors, not just one. There are a lot of solutions out there. They have been kind of a uh, I would I generally say, um, you know, they're built for something else, but now that mobile is uh, uh, coming up and becoming the next desktop, uh, you know, they're kind of uh, porting that solution for this. Uh, but so you've got to look for something that can protect you against every different type of a threat uh, uh, that's out there when it comes to mobile. Okay, so let's look at the answer to the poll question. Um, what major impact would your business face? <laughs> All of the above. So <laughs> lots of implications of, uh, yeah. of what we're talking about today. Um, all right, not let's keep going, Rajiv. Yeah, look, okay. it, it doesn't surprise me at all either. <laughs> all right. So when it comes to solution, uh, you know, the solution is pretty simple, right? Um, you know, we are the industry's uh, leading or uh, the first mobile IPS solution. It's uh, a simple application that runs in a user mode uh, on the uh, mobile device. Uh, we do support Android and iOS, iPhones uh, or basically phones and tablets. Uh, the other mobile devices like Windows uh, 10 and uh, uh, some of the desktop, uh, you know, especially the Mac, laptops, those are uh, part of the roadmap, but mainly as of today we support Android and iOS platforms. And then the second piece to the puzzle is the console, which is the central dashboarding management console. Um, so uh, Danny, you talked about uh, security analytics and uh, intelligence. That's what this basically the console is all about. It uh, provides uh, security administrators and incident response teams uh, the insight into where the attack came from, who the bad guy is, you know, and try all the data that's needed to reverse engineer the entire cyber kill chain. Uh, for the lack of a better word. So that's, those are the two pieces to the puzzle. And uh, just going deeper into what uh, what's inside this Zips, or uh, Zips is the name of the app, by the way. So uh, it, we, you know, I, I think I highlighted the concept of a layered uh, security strategy, right? When it comes to security, there's no silver bullet that can give you the solution to everything. So we realize that as part of our own uh, solution, and we have adopted the same strategy within our app. So we do protect you against all sorts of physical attacks coming from uh, malicious USB chargers and whatnot, coming, the attacks coming from the network side, whether those are all sorts of reconnaissance scans or man-in-the-middle attacks uh, and whatnot. And uh, similarly, uh, when it comes to the device, uh, you could be downloading the malware from, you know, malicious apps from legit legitimate stores or uh, uh, from, uh, you know, some other Chinese app stores or uh, side-loading the apps, uh, some other means. Uh, but uh, we do provide uh, security against both known and unknown malware, uh, both in-device and cloud-assisted. In case you are, you know, uh, downloading a very some malware that's not known, then we do use some cloud services that can help us uh, diagnose that malware more deeply. And uh, the last two layers are more about, uh, you know, detecting adware. The malicious code that can change network configurations on your device, like for example, somebody can change the proxy settings, the default proxy settings on the phone, uh, thereby then uh, that server uh, that's set up as a proxy can now detect and decipher everything that goes in and out of that phone. Uh, and the last layer is number six is where uh, I call it if all hell breaks loose, if uh, none of the other layers are able to protect you against uh, the attack that's coming in, which is mainly uh, always the zero day, the unknown. Uh, of the unknown, right? There's a brand new coming out of uh, the bad guy's factory, and that's where the Z9 actually still protects you against these zero-day exploits. And the reason we are able to do that is because our patented, uh, you know, Z9 engine, uh, which is built on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So machine learning is actually by far the most favorite topic for any, uh, you know, uh, computer science graduate uh, graduating these days. They all like to work on you know, machine learning and whatnot. And uh, while the concepts are pretty 
straightforward. The applications of machine learning is equally very, very hard, right? It's very hard to make something real out of the machine learning, and uh, it took us four years to actually take the data uh, from hundreds of devices, generating billions of data points by capturing these kernel parameters from of these devices and these kernel parameters when I'm talking about these are basically the derivatives of uh, you know as every time the kernel executes any kind of an instruction set uh, it updates all these different registers and we capture these registers and uh, parameters and we feed that data to our you know kind of a machine learning algorithms which in and uh, generate these Z9 models which are nothing but these uh, ugly looking equations these equations are basically very simple and uh, small uh, less than 100 KB in size so what you're running on your device is simple equations that look for anomaly detection, that checks for whether your phone is working great or not. And the easiest way to really comprehend what's happening here is think about yourself as a, your human body, and when you get infected by something, you know, you go to the doctor, and the doctor basically says, hey, uh, I'd like to take some blood samples, I'm going to do some, run some tests, you know, they look for certain things, and then ultimately diagnose that, hey, you've been infected by a virus. And that virus could be a zero day, brand new, nobody knew about it. But that uh, that analysis that Dr. did at the atomic level allows him to actually come, with, come back with the conclusion that you've been infected by a virus. That's exactly something what's happening here, right? At the atomic level on the phone, we are diagnosing whether your phone, you know, is working correctly or not. And that's why we have the ability to detect uh, the zero day. Right. So that's Rajiv, the most important. I'm going to have to interrupt you. Unfortunately, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So just if you could run through those last two slides, and then and then I want you guys to think about what the the one thing that you'd leave the audience with that they could actually action. You know, what would you suggest that they do uh, in thinking about the, the the content that we've gone through today? So over to you just to finish up, Rajiv. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, so. Just one slide, just to summarize that Z9 that I just talked about, right? Uh, you know, these are all different type of uh, threats, uh, high-profile threats that have came to uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, in the last, I would say, year or year and a half. But uh, the most important point here is the Z9 engine never re required any kind of a retraining for us to be able to detect these attacks uh, or vulnerabilities, right? So that's kind of the testament and the validation of our Z9 engine that unlike the antivirus where uh, digital hashes have to be updated every every time, every week, almost multiple times a day, right? Uh, this technology allows us to be actually future-proof. So uh, we are sure that, uh, you know, the next uh, uh, 12, 15 attacks that's going to come out in the market, uh, you know, we have very high confidence that we can actually catch them without any kind of a retraining needed. So with that, uh, let me kind of, uh, you know, that just summarizes the entire thing. I'm going to highlight a few things that as you guys select, uh, you know, the mobile security solution that's good right for you, uh, keep in mind few aspects like uh, user privacy, right? Uh, you don't want to be invading to the user privacy because that's what has pushed back a lot of the uh, other security solutions from adoption point of view, right? The, these uh, users are very security conscious and privacy conscious, so they don't want invasion of privacy. So the, the success that you're going to get in uh, adoption uh, relies on how invasive are you in adoption of your technology and then uh, your ability to catch or be future proof in terms of your ability to catch a known and unknown and then the most important part is the battery and the user experience you don't want to be having something which would drain your battery in a matter of days or weeks because you're uploading the data into the cloud all the time or do something I know some that has to actually make sure it's built for mobile and it doesn't take uh, too much of the battery I think that's Thanks, pretty much Rajiv. it Thank you very much, and, and Danny, if you, if you wouldn't mind, in under 30 seconds, if you've got one actionable or one, one takeaway to leave the audience with. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, just really quickly, I mean, um, the key thing here is to kind of take a look at your business holistic and look at the operational model and take a risk-based approach in terms of defining uh, your security policies as it relate to mobility technologies and then look at what are the security controls that actually facilitate and pr protect your corporate data. Fantastic. Great, great point to end on. Danny and Rajiv, thank you both so much for today. Very, very informative. I've learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else has as well. So thank you guys. Thanks, Jerry. And thank for everyone on the line, thank, thank you for joining in and listening. I hope you've learned as much as I have. Um, they, we're going to send you to a survey at the end of this session, so don't forget to fill that out for us. We love to learn everything that we can do better. 
and uh, I've been your host, Jeremy Little. Thank you very much again for joining us, and I hope to see you on a future Telstra Virtual Live event. Thank you very much.